I'm Mikel, a project manager from ICT, and uh, today with me is Adrián. I will be doing this first part of the presentation, and then Adrián will take the relay. We are from ICT, a company that provides technological solutions for NGOs, international institutions, research centers, and we help our clients achieve their goals uh, by usually by providing custom solutions on top of DHIS. We have been working with the HAS for nine years now, a bit more, and we have made co different contributions to the core, to different apps, and we usually, we usually provide uh, custom solutions, as I said, and this custom so from these solutions, we have been growing uh, different applications, different tools that we started using internally, and then, then we share with the community, and you will find all these uh, all these tools in our website with a brief explanation and links um, to the different repositories for those for those tools. Uh, you can find you can find all our tools in GitHub with source code that you can compile yourself and contribute. Also with the latest releases that you can install directly in DHAS. And you can also find these tools in the App Hub, most of them, not all of them, because not all of, not all the tools that we will be showcasing today are uh, DHAS apps. Most of them are. Today, we will be seeing uh, mainly the first five of this list. I will be providing uh, a brief introduction, like a user perspective for, for the different apps. And, and Adrian will be like dissecting more the apps and providing uh, technical insight and also explaining some uh, some interesting things about uh, the problems we have with with some of the apps. So and uh, yeah, so uh, we will be covering the first five and just briefly going over the the other ones. But please check those apps out. Uh, Maybe some of them will be useful to you starting today. And we will be starting for, from uh, with Metadata Sync, Metadata Sync, which is, uh, as uh, Rene already said, the, the DHAS Conference App Contest winner. We are very proud of Metadata Sync. It's a very powerful tool that we use daily on our company and that we know that the community also uses and we are very happy about that. This is a tool that lets us uh, um, migrate metadata and data, which is, uh, it's said very quickly, but it's a lot. Uh, what we do is we, uh, we provide migrations between servers, which is, it has different use cases. For example, in our case, we use it a lot to migrate between development and production servers. We know a lot of uh, people in the community use it to uh, migrate from field servers to central servers, for example, in, in low connectivity situation. And in any situation in which you need to move data and metadata between servers, it's very useful. Uh, as you can see, you can migrate aggregate data, events, or metadata. And for each of these, you can either um, create rules that bundle some metadata together or create a one-off migration. And these rules are very potent, as you all sure know that you need when handling metadata because there are lots of dependencies and there is like lots of different scenarios and you can um, select some dependencies of this metadata, uh, make inclusion rules, exclusion rules. It's uh, very potent in that way. But also, it's very interesting because you can create packages from these rules. And these packages is a way of for a server to like publicize that there is this metadata and another server can subscribe to that and get notifications when this changes, when any of these packages changes. And and install the changes with one click. So that's all for now for Metadata Sync, but we will be coming back to it. So uh, please, if you have questions, feel free to ask them on the chat, but we will be coming back to it. Next up is Bulkload. Bulkload is our app to uh, import and export uh, 
to to Excel and from Excel and also uh, for LibreOffice. And this is one of the use cases also for bulk load is also in these low connectivity settings. Uh, you can uh, do that data entry with an Excel and when you have connectivity, upload it. And this, um, these Excel files, Excel files, we provide a template. You can select a data set, for example, and download an Excel file and it will have all the info information you need to start filling it pre-filled, but sometimes uh, data entry is very complex. So one of the other use cases we have for, um, for bulk load is to create a template, create a custom Excel file. And if the Excel file um, has some of the information the, the, that it's embedded there, you can style it in any way. We have seen uh, really impressive Excel files that look like a paper form and then import it from, from there. So that's another of the use cases. And next up, we have training app. Training app, it's, it's, uh, it's an app that provides a graphical interface to create tutorials. And also it's the app to launch these uh, tutorials. So this graphical interface uh, helps you on creating these nice looking tutorials. But the most interesting thing is that uh, these tutorials live on top of your DHAS installation. So you can follow along the different steps, navigating through the, the app you are showcasing or whatever you need training for and selecting and, and acting on, on this app while you see the information. And this window can be moved and reside so you can work in your DHAS installation. But not only that, um, there are some cores. Every, every training, uh, we call it a core. And there are some core modules, sorry, modules. So co some core modules developed with clients that we released as an open source. And as you can see, some of those are for um, native apps that are widely used. So maybe you can already uh, start using that with some of your users and, and see how training app works. And next up is homepage app. Homepage app is it's another mm, like user interface helper. It creates uh, home landing pages that funnel the user to specific parts of the HAS. This is highly customizable uh, with uh, user uh, graphical interface to create this kind of home pages. And the, the use case we mostly have for that is to provide the user with direct access to different parts of the HAS without the HAS complexity. You can link apps, you can link uh, actions in the HAS, you can link dashboards, uh, different kinds of visualizations. So it's very it's very useful if you have some users that only need this uh, to go to these parts of the HAS. Next up, we have user extended. User Extended is an app that uh, builds on top of user management and provides uh, advanced functionalities. For example, advanced search, you can filter search by, by user role, but different, uh, different fields. Uh, and once you find uh, a set of users, you can apply bulk actions to those users, for example, changing the user role of all of them at once or changing a group or changing some information or exporting this particular set of users because the other uh, one other uh, part of user extended is importing and exporting. We can import and export uh, to JSON or, or CSV and also duplicating. Um, for example, one of the use case for that is you can create a hospital template user with the right permissions, the right uh, roles. And then when you get the information, for, for example, for a new hospital user, you can duplicate this user and you already have all that. And of course you can change uh, email and all other personal information. And okay, that was like the main ones, but other apps that we also have is the 
Google Earth Engine app that lets us import data from Google Earth Engine from any Google Earth Engine repository to uh, data elements. Sharing setting that allows us to sh uh, change sharing settings in bulk. D2 Docker, Docker, that is a Docker wrapper that makes working with Docker a bit easier. It's a terminal tool and it's uh, still um, complex, but it's faster, uh, faster, I mean, in less commands. Uh, Docker takes the same time, but it's easier to work with. Dashboard reports that allows us to expo export um, reports as a Word document. D2 autogen forms, that was also presented as a poster in in the conference. That is a, a tool to generate data entry forms, and it's also quite complex. And predictor extended app that uh, allows us to manage predictors. And lastly, I wanted to cover to another thing that we use a lot. It's not an app, but it's a repository of tools of terminal tools. Uh, command line tools for DHAS. Um, this is also open source, of course, of course, and you can check it and maybe use it. And there are like more than 20 tools, and but some of them are is, for example, a tool to detect duplicate events, one to move events uh, between organization units, one to take a recording of some actions in a browser and run it as a stress test in multiple times with random intervals. Um, another to execute program, uh, program rules directly from the terminal. For example, if you change some program rule and you want to test it, you can do that from there. Or to copy organization units from one data set to multiple data sets. Uh, all of these tools are things that we do a lot. So maybe you do that too. And when we when we have a need, we try to codify it in a tool that we, we can reuse. And then we share it to a community in the hope that it's useful also for you. And with all that, I will uh, pass the screen now to Adrian. Ian. As soon as I can stop sharing. Yeah. Thank you, Miguel. I'm sharing my screen now. Um, you can see it, right? Yes. You can see my screen. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so I'm, uh, this is Adrian from NCT. I'm gonna be focused a little bit more on the technical parts of the apps. So I want to explain you a little bit like how we build the apps. Um, also, I will be talking all the time about challenges, like uh, things that we need to implement in a different way, find a workaround, or, or maybe just accept that it couldn't be done. So I'm gonna be kind of mixing the two things. So very quickly, uh, our apps are the way that we build our apps is very similar to the way that the DHIS core team build the core apps. So we use uh, React.js and TypeScript. Uh, I know that the DHIS core team is moving to TypeScript uh, now and in the recent month. We have been using TypeScript for many years now because it, it is particularly useful for us for um, basically uh, it facilitates the, the way we maintain the app and to detect any bugs. So TypeScript is like a critical point for app. Uh, on top of that, in React.js, we use like the typical framework. So bit uh, for the app, uh, then bit test, um, playwright for the test, unit test and end-to-end -end test. And we use a lot of uh, GitHub and GitHub actions. I will be mentioning some of these things in the future. Architecture, I don't want to talk too much about this. This could be like, several sessions just to tell you that we are using clean architecture. This is particularly useful for us, again, for scalability and for testing. It generates like, well, basically we have like different layers layers, and it facilitates testing um, and maintaining the apps. And for some of our apps, we have DHIS as a backend, but we can also have different backends. And this is particularly useful with clean architecture. 
Uh, as Mikel said, everything is open source, so you can find our app or our apps. I, I link that in the chat, but basically you can also find it in our GitHub repo. So if you go to github.com slash ICT, you will see that all our apps are there, the source code, the release notes and everything. So uh, all is public, basically. Uh, and now, yes, now I wanted to tell you a little bit like the different modules that we have in our apps, and I will be talking about some of the challenges. So in this diagram, what I'm showing you is like the main boss, where main box where you have basically the, the core of the apps, uh, that is the business logic. And this module that I'm showing you here is D2 API. This is a module that we use to interact with DHIS. This module, by the way, is on NPM, so you can download it uh, into your packet.json and start using it. On top of that, it's also on GitHub. And something is a little bit technical, but something that we have started with, doing since a few years is that uh, the schemas for the API, we are automatically generating those schemas. Basically, we go to this endpoint that I, I have over here. This is slash API slash schemas. And um, based on the information that is there, we generate the TypeScript. Uh, so it's fully typed. This is particularly useful when we have to move to a new version. I will talk about this a little bit later on. And um, this basically generates all the information about the endpoint and the type of the field. Okay, so this is what we have been doing so far. Now I know that I find not wrong since 40, uh, we have an implementation of Open API in DHIS. So the idea is to move to open API instead of this schema. And then just to mention that there are a couple of nice figure, uh, features that we have. One is that we have the possibility of cancel the API call. So I don't know if the user clicks somewhere else, we can cancel that call. And then the way you use the API from JavaScript is very similar to the way you use the API from the URL. So this is particularly useful for developers or for junior developers. Um uh, nothing else about D2 API. Another module that we have is D2 UI component. This module is also on NPM. It can be used. This module contains different, different graphical interface, some of them coming from the DHIS core team, some of them developed by us, some of them coming from Material UI. Um, basically, right now we have a combination of D2 UI and UI component. D2 UI is the deprecated library from the DHIS core team. We only have two components missing uh, that we need to migrate into UI. That is basically the origin tree and the multi-selector panel. Uh, that is part of the work that we need to do in order to be uh, basically with the race and component. Uh, feedback components is a nice graphical interface that we have is this one that I show in over here. So in all our apps, you will see that you have a bottom on the on the bottom right corner. And if you click on this, you can send us some feedback and you can even send us a screenshot. Okay, so this we have been adding to all our apps and it's particularly useful to get uh, feedback from the community. Whenever you send this, what happened behind the scenes is that we receive uh, basically a, an issue on ClickUp. ClickUp is the way we manage our project. The platform we use to manage our project is similar to, to Jira. And then there are two things we can do. If there is some sensitive data, we basically send an email to the person and try to communicate with the person. If this is a feature request, or if this is a bug that we need to solve, we typically create an issue on our roadmap. That is something that I want to share with you. If you go again to ICT inside GitHub and click on projects, uh, you will see that we have uh, many different roadmaps for all our apps. In this roadmap, you will be able to see like the issues that are part of each release and um, basically who pay for them if this was internally developed as this one, or if it was developed by WHO in this case or Samaritan's Pools. And we also have a column, I will come back to this column later on with some ideas coming from the community. Uh, and basically these ideas are things that we do internally or somebody else and our organization comes and fund the idea. So this is kind of our business model was I describing. Everything is open source. We develop some things for the community. If you want something to be done for you, uh, please fund the idea uh, and we will be implementing it. So 
this roadmaps are again public and you can see what is coming next. Um, uh, nothing else, else for you to know. Uh, the next module uh, is an example of a critical library for us. Is uh, Basically, uh, this is a library that we use to generate Excel and to read Excel. It's obviously used in Balloat and in some other apps. Uh, the thing about this is this, this is also a challenge and this is why I wanted to mention this. Uh, we were analyzing different, different open source Excel libraries. <clears throat> um, and basically there is not like a good one. Uh, there are, we analyzed three of them and all of them has some limitation. We decided to go for this one. And this was a library uh, that was widely used for the community, but basically it was maintained by somebody. He was not from Nebraska, but he was somebody that was maintaining this for uh, thousands of, of projects basically. And this is particularly challenging because as you know, uh, the implementation in Excel is different from Windows and Linux. And also like Windows is not sharing the specification. So it's kind of a reverse engineering process. So uh, the, the challenge here is that this guy, this DT Johnson decided not to maintain the application anymore. He decided to go for some beers with his friends. So what we did was like fork this, this library and start maintaining the, the nice thing that happened is that we have started receiving like contribution from the community. Uh, we are not like the main force, there are several force, but this is something that is happening. So I guess we are now the guy from Nebraska that is maintaining these things. But this is uh, obviously one challenge that we have. Um, a lot of organizations, as you know, love uh, working with Excel. Um, well, this is a limitation. Uh, and the last module that I wanted to talk about is D2Locket. This is something that we presented in the annual conference last month. So I'm, I'm linking here the video in case you want to have a look. In this video, basically it's a technical session where we explain how to use it. The idea is that with this library, you can lock uh, any information in your apps into an event program or a tracker program in a very easy way. And I'm going to talk much about this. You can use it, it's open source and it's in, on NPN as well. And the final thing uh, that I wanted to mention is that in some of our apps, we, they are completely custom. For example, the one that Mikael was showing, but uh, we have also some hybrid cases where we have custom interfaces and interfaces where we use uh, DHIS core apps and DHIS visualization. I will talk about this a little bit more later on with some challenges that we have when we try to integrate the DHIS core apps. Uh, final thing about this is that all this, uh, you can find it again public in our repository is uh, the DHIS skeleton that we use every time that we need to build a new app. Uh, just uh, to mention that we are not using the application platform uh, we are not against it, but there were some limitations for us, like to use clean architecture in this, I think it's called APP platform or, or the DHIS engine. Uh, what's, well, to, to use clean architecture with that was a little bit difficult for us. We also found some limitation in the API. And it's been a while since I look into that, but it didn't have TypeScript. I don't know if maybe now it, it's, in, it's on TypeScript. But this was also a limitation I, I just want to mention. So you, you know why we, we have developed like our, our skeleton. And nothing else about this. Now I want to focus a little bit more on the challenges. I have been mentioning some of them. Um, well, basically, uh, this I think is like somehow like the most typical challenge that we have in the community. Like every time there is a new version, you need to check the API and see if there are changes. Uh, the good thing is that the changes are not like as dramatical or as uh, big as they were in the past, but they are still some changes. For us, what is working really nice is that everything is in TypeScript. So basically, what for example, what we have right now is that our applications are working from 236 up to 240, and we are about to move to 241, basically the compatibility. So what we typically do is we generate the schemas for 240. And as, as 
they are in TypeScript, we, you open open Visual Studio and you automatically detect like the arrows. I don't know, for example, this field used to be a text and now it's a number. So it's easy to fix. Still, there are some changes that require some work. I mean, this, this is easy to, to fix, but for example, you deprecate the old tracker MPI, you move into the new one. Obviously this requires like a lot of changes. So this is a challenge, it's not easy to solve, but we have kind of uh, a little bit under control with this TypeScript approach. Uh, next thing is a uh, data store. Uh, I'm gonna talk about two specific problems, but first I wanted to tell you what I think is the general problem. So I guess everybody's doing the same. Basically when you are building an app, what you try to use is the DHIS data model event tracker, the metadata that is in DHIS. At a certain point, maybe you, you don't have enough. You need something else to start to uh, store some extra information that cannot fit into the DHIS data model. So you start uh, using the data store. The problem with the data store is that, or not the problem with the data store, or the problem with, with what we are trying to do is that we are trying to fit a relational database into a key value data store. And sometimes it's, this is too much. I'm not saying that this happens all the time. Sometimes what you want to store in the data store is really simple, but sometimes it's really complex. Um, well, we kind of squeeze a relational database into that and this generates some problems. This is something that I presented la last month in Oslo, so I don't want to go too much into the detail, also because it's a little bit technical, but just to give you an overview, this is the data store that we have in Metadata Sync, what Mikel was describing, the application that Mikel was explaining before. Uh, this application helps you with the synchronization between different servers. And what we have on the left is what we wanted to build, like six keys, and basically each keys each key contain an array of object inside. The problem is that until this version or until the recent version, whenever you want to store the data, whenever you want to change the data store, you need to do a full update of all the information. And obviously this was impacting the performance of the application. So every time the user click on something, he needs to wait for 10 seconds until you fetch all the information from the data store, you change one field and you upload that information back. So uh, in order to avoid this problem, what we did is this process, we kind of flatten the model and what we're supposed to objects inside the keys, we move it outside. And I have an example for you over here. So for example, uh, the mappings is basically uh, information about uh, this piece of metadata in the origin correct, uh, is basically this other piece of metadata in the destination. So what we are doing here is this key that you can see over here was supposed to be part of this array and we are moving one level up, okay? This way we can only update this, this key instead of the whole mapping, instead of the whole array and this makes everything a little bit faster. This is the workaround that we implemented and obviously now that we have partial updates as something in the core, we want to go back to the original idea that is this one. And this is basically the next challenge that we have. It's like the data store is a database for us and for many developers. So you need to have a way to change your, your data model. And this is where migration comes. Uh, this is the same concept that we have in the DHIS score. So when you move into a new version, a lot of migrations are executed. These migration, as you know, are executed with Flyway, that is the technology. And basically these migrations are changing the database, maybe adding a new column in the user table, uh, a new index in some other table and this kind of thing. Same thing, you have the same thing, same thing in Android. If you think about it, there are also migrations in the Android database. So we have built something similar. So basically when you open uh, one of our applications, the first thing that happens is that we check the data model of the data store. In this case, what I'm showing you is the migration for metadata scene. So it has detected that the data store is in version zero and the application re requires version 11 to work. So basically what we start doing is like a lot of different steps in order to change the data store and feed. And this is now what we have to do for what I was explaining before. To go back to this original idea, we will have to implement a migration that change this into this, okay? 
and we will be creating we will be creating version twelve. Uh, okay. Um, related also to metadata sync, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the security. Okay, and this is what I have in this slide. Basically, uh, metadata sync is one of these apps where security is particularly important. Basically, because we are synchronizing data between different servers, so you need to have information about the other server. Basically, uh, uh, credentials, URL, and this kind of thing. So this application started five years ago. It originally started by his South Africa. Okay, so. He basically funded us to develop the application, then the application with developed by WHO, MSF, CHAI, well, Samaritan Purse, many different organizations, and it has been growing. Uh, so after two years, we started developing in 2019. After two years, uh, we met with the University of Oslo, with the DHIS core team, and we started discussing these security aspects. And we implemented three things, okay, that I wanted to tell you because maybe you don't know about them and they, they are particularly useful. The first thing is that we add to the manifest a new feature. These features were not available at the beginning and they were introduced in 233, if I'm not wrong. So we add in the manifest, uh, basically uh, the data store name in Spain. What this makes is that this has an extra, sec uh, some, extra security measures to the data store. So if you go to the data store app, you can only see the key of metadata sync if you also have access to metadata sync. So you need two authorities, the authority to see the data store and the authority to see the metadata sync. So this narrow down the number of users that can access the information in the data store. And the second thing is that there are sharing settings also in the data store. They are not available through the graphical interface, but it's something that you can implement through the API. So what we did is automatically make everything private in the data store, and then basically provide a graphical interface in metadata sync to change the setting setting. And this is related to what I was mentioning before. So if, you, if I go back to the previous slide, this message over here, over here is when in 2021, 20, we introduced the sharing setting and we were explaining the user now there is a sharing setting, everything is private. If you want to change the sharing setting, you need to go to this section and explicitly give access to that part of the data store to a user or to a user group. Okay. The final thing that we did is to encrypt the information in the data store. So it was not plain test, but it was encrypted. We keep developing this, uh, and this year when we send the application, uh, we receive another email and say like, okay, can we meet and keep discussing about securities? And we have a super nice meeting with Michael and Austin about, and Marcus, if I'm not wrong, about security. Um, basically what came out of this was an analysis that we did to the code with two tools, in particular, these two sneak and dependency track, there are plenty of them. Um, and it's something that is nice to have in your apps. Basically, we now have integrated this with GitHub so that every time there is a new pull request, these tools are executed. And this checks two things, vulnerabilities in your codes and vulnerabilities in your dependencies. Okay, so we analyze the code and we fix a few things. I have kind of divided the problems in three different kinds of problems. Some of them were dependencies, basically dependencies that have vulnerability and you need to update, which is also a challenge because also this requires time from you to update all the time the dependencies. Then there were false positives that you need to analyze. Uh, like, uh, I don't know, we have four positives, like uh, these uh, libraries were detecting something like a regular expression, and it was actually a Lodas function, or an error that was part of a script that was not distributed to the community, it was used to generate the variance, and it was detected like that. And there were also some minor error in the source code that we fixed it. So with all of this, we release a new version and we fix the problem. I just wanted to mention this, because some of these measures can be interesting for you uh, in the apps as well. Okay, uh, now I want to talk about another of the challenge that we have, uh, something that we are working a lot on at ICT internally, that is how to support the community. We are receiving more and more emails and more and more 
request basically for new features for changes and so on. So the first one is something that I mentioned before is like the kind of challenges that we have because we're making everything open source. Uh, so there are some people that there are some people that are basically using our, our app and this is completely fine. Uh, uh, for they take their our app and then they decided to use it and they potentially invoice an organization for the use and for the configuration of our apps, which is correct. But then they ask us to fix bugs. And it's like, okay, but it's like, we don't have the funds to fix it. So we are trying to see how we can explain this and how, how we can have some internal budget to maintain our application. Uh, we have some kind of contract that allows us to maintain the app in the long terms, like a five-year long-term agreement with no WHO that helps us on maintaining the app and keeping them uh, up to date. What I mentioned before, share sensitive data. Sometimes the people report bugs, but basically uh, we don't have uh, a way to test the, the bug if we don't have access to the server. And then uh, community channels. Uh, right now we are going for these three ways of talking to the community. The roadmap that I shared before, the feedback component that I also was explaining. And we have noted that some people uh, is asking questions in the community of practice at DHS. This is super nice and it's a good way to share information and to understand the use cases of the people. The last two things that I have over here is what I, we mentioned before, that basically we're using a pub and GitHub repository, but we are closing the issues in our GitHub repository. It was too difficult to maintain and it was taking a lot of time from us. Okay, and now the final two challenges, I know most of them, uh, that I mentioned before is in our apps, some of our apps, we integrate visualizations from DHIS and we also integrate core apps from DHIS. So this that I'm showing is one of our generic apps that Miguel didn't explain, but it's also in AppHub and so on. This is called Dashboard Report. Basically you select a dashboard over here and then you add like a report template. If you click on export, all of this is gonna end up in a Word document with a, the format that you decide, with the text field that you decide, the information that you want as well. So each of these is uh, embedded in here with a technology that is plugin.js, that is part of the DHIS backend and was the way uh, that basically you integrate visualization and it was the way that Dashboard used to work. Okay, Dashboard used to use this plugin.js and this is how we, we build this application. We have some other example. This is, for example, a custom application where you can introduce data using this button and analyze the data in here. This is obviously a pivot table that we have integrated using uh, this technology. This is also public, by the way, is the universal health coverage. This is a public, uh, Website, there are not credentials. So we are using another nice feature that we have in DHIS that is this personal access token, I think it is. Uh, is the way we are basically using the visualizations uh, without asking the user for credential. This is a DHIS visualization and we, are, we have indicators behind the scene. So in order to do this, what we were using was plugin.js. Uh, Plugin.js seems to be deprecated. I understand. It's my understanding based on some conversation with Austin, Kai, Bill, and so on. And the new way of doing this is plugin.html. So we are moving all of our application to plugin.html. Um, that, by the way, we, we have already tested and it's nicer the way you interact and the way you use it. Uh, and I'm not sure about this that I wrote over here. I don't know if for visualization, the idea is also to move the visualization into global cell or to stay here in plugin HTML. But well, this is one of the challenge that the technology is changing and we need to change with the, the, with the technology. I assume that plugin.js, by the way, is deprecated because there are some bugs and I'm linking it here that uh, basically limit the way you can use plugin.js or so certain visualization uh, that don't work with plugin.js. And the final thing that I wanted to tell you is how to integrate DHIS core apps is something that we have with 
I'm showing you over here is a custom application. Completely custom is super simple. Okay, it's just these seven buttons. And it's an application that we developed for Samaritan Spurs and they are using it a lot. Uh, it, it is currently being used in Ukraine in the war. It's used for the, it was used for the Turkey earthquake. It was uh, used in Azerbaijan in South Sudan. And this is what I mentioned before. It's a combination of custom interfaces and DHI escorting. So for example, this one over here, the response configuration is a canton interface where they basically introduce all this field and behind the scene, we generate for them the organization unit, the organization unit group, the dashboard, we associate the organization unit with the data set and the program. But this is the only custom interface. All the other interfaces, this one is a tracker program and this one are dashboard, is basically reusing the DHIS core app. Okay, so if you click, for example, in this one, that is the one that I'm showing, what you will get is something like this. Okay, as you can see, this is a dashboard. It's a DHIS dashboard. The only thing that it changes is that you have uh, basically the, the header over here and, a, and an arrow. So this basically gives something nice to the user that this is something that a medical team can use even when they don't have much knowledge about DHIS, they only have these seven buttons and this is what they need to care. They go into the dashboard, when they are done, they click back and they are in the landing page. So uh, this is something that we are building more and more, but it has some challenges. This is another example of what I'm describing. Uh, as you all know, this is tracker capture in an iframe. Left side, we have an organization unit tree, a custom one. This one in particular is uh, basically showing only a subset of the organization unit tree, whatever is relevant for this particular problem. And this one, uh, and I will come back to this one anymore. This is the same example, but with data approval. This by the way is 240, and this is running data approval. So for this or this integration, we typically use, uh, we have been using a pure iPhone. The problem with poor iframe is that then you want to manipulate the DOM, you want to hide the header, you want to hide some drop downs and so on. Um, and as you may know, react and manipulate the DOM is not a good idea to do the same, the two things at the same time. So we had some very nice conversation with Kai and Birk and they said yes, that maybe we can use the same technology that we have for the visualization, the plugin.html. And this is what we are doing for some of our apps. Um, basically, the problem about this is that we have to generate a fork of the DHIS core app. And on top of that, apply our, this plugin infrastructure. And then we need to maintain the fork. It's not a big deal. This plugin infrastructure is really simple, but it's, uh, it's what we are doing to integrate the apps. Um, the next thing, if I'm not wrong, is Global Shell. That is something that is in 41, and I guess it will be expanded in future version. But for now, as most of our clients and the community is not in 41 yet, we will stay with plugin.html. And this is all. Uh, it's a lot of information. I hope it was useful. So our plan for the future is kind of keep improving the way we communicate with you, the way we extend application um, and nothing else and keep sharing your use case with us because it's really useful uh, to understand the kind of problem that you have and what is useful for you. Last month we were in Oslo and it, it was nice to hear from you because we were we didn't know that some of our applications were used and the kind of uses that you were doing. So yeah, we are more than happy to hear from you and nothing else. Thank you very much.